Here we go. Hello, everyone. Good day. I'm Audrey Coleman. I'm Associate Director and Director of Museum and Archives at the Dole Institute of Politics, and I'm so excited to have you join me today for our third installment of our exhibit update for the League of Wives, Vietnam's POW MIA Allies and Advocates. Uh, today, I have with me Andrew Talkov from the Virginia Museum of History and Culture. He's the Senior Director of Curatorial Affairs, and I'm so pleased to have you with us today, Andy. Oh, thanks, Audrey. I'm, I'm really happy to uh, revisit uh, this amazing exhibit that opened just over a year ago uh, at our institution. So I'm looking forward to talking with you about our experience. Yeah, I should mention that the Virginia Museum, because of your support and Colorado Springs, you both were co-sponsors of the traveling exhibit. Um, so the installation opened at the Dole Institute in 2017. Um, based on the work of curator Heath Hardage Lee, historian and author of the book by the same name. She was also our Dole Archives Curatorial Fellow in 2016. Um, but that installation at the Dole Institute was funded by Harlan and Alice Ann Oaks of Colorado Springs um, and the support of the folks at the Virginia Museum and Colorado Springs Pioneers Museum enabled us to reformat um, that exhibit and so that it could travel all over the country, uh, first to Colorado Springs and then to Virginia Museum of History and Culture. Uh, and it continues today. So Virginia was the second stop uh, for the traveling piece. And this story has, um, it's, a, it's a story of national leadership, of women's leadership that has big implications, but it all starts at different points, local points across the country. And so it has national local impact for you all, uh, Andy, at Richmond in the Virginia area. Would you talk a little bit about that? Sure. Well, um, well I think that the story is, the story of the uh, League of Wives was was already known by a lot of people in the Richmond area because of the prominence of uh, Phyllis Galante and her husband, Lieutenant Commander Paul Galante, who was um, was uh, shot down uh, over Vietnam and uh, was a prisoner of war for seven seven years uh, in Hanoi. Um, in fact. Uh, in 2010, the Virginia War Memorial, which is located in Richmond, opened a Paul and Phyllis Galante Education Center. And, and much you know, closer to our institution, in 2003, um, Phyllis donated her personal papers to our institution, um, which is really a treasure trove of information about her um, her experience with the league. So um, the story was somewhat well known in Richmond because of that family's, you know, their family's prominence. Um, it wasn't really until the exhibition came, was organized and came to Richmond that um, I realized just how much broader Virginia's association with this story is. So as the Virginia Museum of History and Culture we are located in Richmond, Virginia, but really we tell the story of the entire Commonwealth. And so it was, um, so it was very eye-opening to realize that there were a number of other very prominent women in the league who were also Virginians. Um, and so I think that for that reason, and also because the families of the women are still here and they have connections. And so it was, um, it was, it was good to get the word out uh, to people. Um, but I think primarily our audience does relate very strongly to local stories. And Phyllis's story is so compelling um, as are the stories of, of these other women. And you had some uh, items of Phyllis's, some artifacts from Phyllis already on display at your museum, right? In your permanent exhibit, is that right? Yeah, so, um, so we tapped into, so we have a, an exhibit called The Story of Virginia, which covers 16,000 years of Virginia history. Um, so any one uh, moment uh, in an exhibit that, uh, you know, has, is limited in size, uh, can only be told in a, a relatively small space. But 
One of our really treasured items is the dress that Phyllis was wearing when she was reunited with Paul in 1973. Um, and of course, that there was a, a photo that was taken of them that appeared on the cover of Newsweek. And so um, the dress became an iconic symbol of the return of not only Paul, but the other POWs. And, um, and so we had that dress on display uh, since 2015. We just rotated it off in favor uh, to give it a rest in favor of another dress that Phyllis owned um, that she wore to, uh, to the White House uh, to meet the First Lady. Um, there are also a few other pieces that we have. Um, another piece that we included in the League of Wives show was um, a piece of toilet paper from the Hanoi Hilton that Paul had been using. We have a number of, of pieces of the toilet paper that he had been using to uh, write a poem on that he wanted to recite to Phyllis when they were eventually reunited. So um, it's, it's uh, always interesting for people to see that sort of ultra personal piece of, uh, of, of, of artifact. Because uh, I don't think too many people think about, you know, toilet paper as being something that would be in a museum collection. Kind of a, it might, that, that concept might be kind of reinvented as we document <laughs> the history of our current situation. Uh, uh, <laughs> it's funny that you mentioned that and and you're absolutely right <laughs> uh, <laughs> toilet paper has become quite quite an important commodity now um, yeah um did you find or did you hear um, from people experiencing the exhibit did this introduce uh new generations or new audiences to the story of the pow's or of vietnam in general yeah, so um, I'm actually really pleased to say that 2019 was the best year of visitation on record at our museum. We saw uh, over 110,000 people. And so during the run of the exhibition, um, you know, we saw almost 50,000 people, more than 50,000 people come through the doors. Um, and it was interesting to see um, sort of multi, like multi-generational groups, you know, grandparents um, who remembered the war uh, very well, and in fact, remembered some of the stories and this entire movement, because um, as you said, it was a national movement. So even our guests that weren't from Virginia, um, who were of a certain age, you know, remembered all of this. And it was really interesting to have them share, to watch them share that story with their children and their children's children at this point. Um, and in fact, one encounter, I, I got an email while the show was coming into its final days from a fellow uh, relatively locally who, uh, whose father was a Vietnam War veteran, and he really wanted his dad to come in and see the exhibit. So I arranged to meet them, and I really enjoyed, uh, for me, it was very meaningful to listen to his father's stories. Um, and he actually remembered as a young child, um, the son did, um, you know, one of the iconic pieces in the exhibit um, is the Halliburton's chandelier of POW bracelets. Mm -hmm. Of course, we have a number of Paul Galanti POW bracelets since people also returned bracelets with his name on them to him and those made it into our collection. But one of the questions I had was how those were distributed? Like how did people buy them and how were the, did they find their way to people's homes and he remembered uh, his mother was involved in the movement in that she was a central hub of distributing those bracelets in the Virginia Beach area and so he remembers the bracelets coming in and then dumping them all over the floor of their living room and then putting them into envelopes so that they could be mailed or given to the people that had ordered them so I thought that was really interesting uh, nice 
nice opportunity to to hear sort of two generations of experience uh you know related to this history mm -hmm. Yeah, I wonder if people if people realize how much as visitors to the museum, how much we learn back af after having put on an exhibit, learned a lot about the topic ourselves, put on an exhibit, uh, and then all the feedback we find out that we've really just touched the tip of the iceberg. So it's really kind of a, a growing process for all of us. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, it's not unusual to learn uh, amazing things about a topic after the exhibit is up, because I think that um you know people it, it puts it in the forefront of people's minds and especially exhibits that we've done um and i'm sure you've had this experience too where the events were within the living memories of people who are visiting the exhibit so i mean really everyone of that generation who walked into the building had some story to tell and you know i'm it's just so excited to be a keeper of those stories, you know, in the line of work that we're in. Yes, definitely. You told, uh, a, a, you made some beautiful remarks at the opening of this exhibit uh, a little over a year ago. Um, and would you recount those about your, about the POW MIA flag? Would you? Sure. Um, well, I think that, you know, even today, but certainly, over the course of my life, I was very familiar with the POW MIA flag. Um, it's certainly an icon and, and it's on flagpoles and it's on car bumpers and car windows. And, um, uh, you know, it's really ubiquitous. I mean, you see it really everywhere um, if, you, if you look uh, and take notice. And I think that the flag's intent uh, as a design piece was very successful. It certainly made you think about the men who were um, at the time prisoners of war who are still missing in action um, and whose whereabouts are unknown. But, but it always had made me think of men. And it wasn't really until we started talking with Keith Lee and you about this exhibition where it became uh, very clear that it was women who were behind the creation of that flag. And so the story was very much a story of determined, uh, dedicated um, women who um, stood behind their husbands and their family members who were missing. And so now I just can't look at that flag and not see the faces of, you know, Phyllis Galanti or Jane Denton or Louise Mulligan. Um, and, and I think that was, was very eye-opening for me, uh, definitely changed my perspective. And I think that that's the great thing about this exhibition is that it tells a story people know, I think people certainly of my age who grew up even, you know, late in the Vietnam War era, um, it definitely puts a perspective that most people, you know, just don't, hadn't considered or didn't think about. And I also think that, you know, you were talking about uh, modern history and the way events can bring people together in this case in their you know in your example in the search for toilet paper but um in this example i mean i think that we think about the vietnam war era as an incredibly divisive period of our history and yet this movement um you know that had been started by the wives and families of our pow's really did unite people across the spectrum as something that they could get behind and support. Yes, it's nice to be reminded of all the different facets of any situation at any, any given point in time. Andy, thank you so much for visiting with us today. We talked about how wonderfully history connects people and shifts our perspective and it's um, this project has been so rewarding to engage in with you and to share with the public. Uh, and so thank you again for your time today and for reminding us of, of, of the power of the work that we do in this project.
Oh, well, thank you so much for sharing this, this really wonderful exhibit with us. And um, yeah, I look forward to learning more stories about this, about this period uh, in the future. Yeah. So we uh, will, next installment, we're going to be chatting with Vicki Stone from the Coronado Historical Association. The League of Wives exhibit just wrapped up its run there uh, in spring 2020. So uh, we'll hear from Vicki and some California stories next time. Thanks so much for joining us today. Bye-bye.